what is up YouTube welcome back to the channel so if you're new here I am a diagnostic and interventional radiology resident and today I just finished an interview for fellowship so wish me luck upon that but afterwards you know I decided you know we work hard uh, and in particular this week I worked particularly hard and one of the best things about being a doctor especially in the field a procedural field like interventional radiology is even though you work really hard you put a lot of hours in you get to come home every night and you get to say, you know what, although I worked really hard, I didn't see my family, I was busy the whole day, but you got to do some cool stuff. And sometimes you're just so consumed and so busy, you don't get to really reflect on the cool stuff that you've done. So what I decided to do is I was like, you know what, I was cleaning up, I was looking at some of my paperwork that I accumulated over just this past week, and I was like, you know what, why don't I decide to take a look at what exactly did I do this entire week in while I was rotating through interventional radiology. So just to be clear, I work at not at an academic institution, it's a small community hospital. So maybe, you know, it may not apply to some places, but I just wanna give you a brief glimpse of what it's like if you're a diagnostic and interventional radiology resident, you're gonna be rotating through interventional radiology. So I figured why not go over what exactly did I do this week and give you an idea of the type of cases and the type of things that interventional radiology does. So without further ado, let's get into it then. So let's talk about a little bit more of the bread and butter stuff. So our days are mixed with inpatient and outpatient procedures. Outpatient procedures are things that are scheduled and we usually try to get to them a little bit earlier in the day as long as we don't have any emergencies going on. So a typical day starts around, I would say 7.30 or so. You come in in the morning, you check on the patients that you did cases on the day before, make sure they're stable. If there was a bleed and you stop the bleed, you wanna make sure when you come in the next day, they're not bleeding. If you put in a tube to drain the kidney or to drain an infection in the abdomen, you wanna make sure that the tube that you put in is still there, hasn't gotten dislodged by accident, and the fact that it's still draining, so it's still doing its job. Once all of that, we do a little bit of a round and we do a huddle where we discuss what are the cases for today. So what I did is I kind of compiled the entire like week, about five days or so of cases to give you a brief example of what, what we've been doing. So some of them, you know, we do multiple of them in this particular week. So let's talk about a little bit the more simpler or the less complex procedures that, that we do, thyroid biopsies. So basically what that is, is somebody comes in, they usually get worked up as an outpatient. Sometimes they have symptoms, sometimes they don't have symptoms, and they have nodules. The thyroid gland is a gland right here in the front of your neck, and sometimes nodules can develop. Some of them can have potential to even become cancerous. And so what happens is that they get, you know, usually through a physical exam, or maybe their blood work might be off, they'll get some imaging done via an ultrasound, and some nodules meet the criteria per size or characteristics that they can be suspicious for cancer. So we wanna make sure that they're, they're not cancerous, because if that's the case, we may have to, you know, or uh, I should say a surgeon will have to remove the thyroid gland, either half of it or all of it. So we do these thyroid biopsies. So what happens then is we use the ultrasound, we locate the exact uh, nodule, and then we take samples. Sometimes we take core samples, which means we take actually like a string of tissue from the actual nodule itself. And other times we just do something called a fine needle aspiration, which means we just take a very tiny needle, we go through the actual lesion and we take pieces from different areas of it. We send it down to the pathology lab. They look at it via microscope and they try to figure out, is this just hyperactive thyroid disease or is this really a tumor that may have to be treated? So thyroid biopsies did a bunch of them. And actually it's a really good skill because now you're working in such a tight area you have blood vessels on the side, carotid artery, you have the internal jugular vein, you wanna make sure obviously you're not gonna damage those. And because you're working with such small needles and in a small area with the ultrasound, it's a good, it's a good uh, practice for you to have nice visualization of, of, of needles uh, via the ultrasound. And that's a skill that you can develop and it can be you know taken in to implement for way bigger cases. So honestly, thyroid biopsies, we do them all the time and it's a really good practice. And as a resident, you get to perform them, which is great. Now next, we do, I'm gonna group them together, paracentesis and thoracentesis. So a paracentesis is when you're actually removing fluid from the abdomen. 
usually due to some kind of liver disease, most of the time portal hypertension, you start to develop a bunch of ascites or peritoneal fluid. That fluid needs to be removed because as the fluid starts to build up, the abdomen can become tense, that fluid can get infected, that fluid can actually push up against the diaphragm, make it difficult for you to breathe. So in situations like that, we've removed the fluid and then now, on this particular week, we did several paracentesis, which is just putting a needle into the abdomen, again, under ultrasound guidance. Everything that we do, we use imaging, uh, like CT, ultrasound, we use that to navigate us doing these surgical procedures. So we use imaging as a navigational tool to do these surgical procedures. So basically, using, again, an ultrasound, we go into the abdomen, drain fluid, send some of it for testing. Now in this particular week, not only did I do some paracentesis, I even placed a Plurex catheter. And what that is, is basically it's a catheter or a straw. You can think of it as almost like a plastic tube. It's a plastic straw that goes underneath the skin and goes into the abdomen. And the reason why it goes underneath the skin is because it creates a tract there. So it can stay there for many, many months. And that way, whenever someone reaccumulates fluid, it's very easy to just kind of turn a lever and you can start to drain fluid straight from the abdomen. So it's a pretty fantastic procedure instead of getting poked several times if you have a condition like a cancer or you have portal hypertension, you have liver disease and you're going to keep accumulating fluid, you can just we can just place a catheter. So this week placed a Plurex catheter. Now I mentioned thoracentesis. That's basically removing fluid from the pleural lining, so from the chest. So it's really it's outside the lungs. Fluid can accumulate there for a multitude of reasons and then that can cause compression upon the actual lungs and the lungs can start to collapse. So people have difficulty breathing. You know, this week did multiple of these where you're putting again via the ultrasound, putting a needle into the actual chest and removing fluid, sending it off for testing. And we, I even placed a couple of chest tubes this week as well, it's same concept. Now it's a tube, plastic tube that goes in between the ribs, comes out, and now we can hook that up to suction, hook it up to a uh, um, Plurovac, and basically, essentially, now we have a chest tube there. They're different than the typical surgical chest tubes. They're a lot smaller in caliber. They make a loop. There's a locking loop at the end of them. So that's how, that's how we drain. So paracentesis, thoracentesis, and actually placing a little bit long-term catheters like a chest tube or a pleurix catheter did that. Now, another thing that interventional radiology does is biopsies and biopsies throughout the entire body. I already talked about doing thyroid nodule biopsies. Let's, let me see, this week, we did a mediastinal mass biopsy. There was a big mass in the thorax, in the front of the thorax or the front of the chest, right beneath the um, chest bone, essentially you can say like the sternum. So basically there was a mass there, went in there via the CAT scan now. Now we're using CAT scan to navigate exactly where we're gonna be doing a surgical procedure, make an incision exactly where you know we localize via the CAT scan. We were able to get a nice core biopsy of this mass that was in the anterior mediastinum. Also did two liver mass biopsies. This can be done via ultrasound or via CT. Both of these cases in particular were done via CT. Again, we have a mass. Sometimes you, the mass is a primary hepatocellular carcinoma or a tumor that's localized to the pancreas that's from uh, localized to the liver from actual liver tissue or oftentimes there's an unknown cancer and someone comes in with abnormal blood work and their liver labs don't look so good and you look you take a look on the imaging and you start to notice that the liver has some abnormal lesions we don't know where the primary is we don't see a primary and this could be metastatic disease so they ask us to take samples so via cat scan did liver biopsy same concept did a lung biopsy this week did two renal biopsies and these were actually not for renal masses these were just trying to get parenchyma from the actual kidney itself because they were looking for people who have declining renal function and may have some kind of underlying renal disease. So we wanna rule out some kind of underlying renal disease. So we actually need tissue from the kidney. The kidney biopsies were actually done via ultrasound. So again, imaging with the ultrasound and we get small needles, make small incision, get small needles within the kidney itself and we take samples of the kidney. And what was cool about these renal biopsies is that after taking the biopsies, while the patient is still on the table, I actually walked the biopsy samples down myself to the pathology lab, reviewed it with an actual pathologist, looked through the microscope, trying to make sure that we have uh, adequate amount of parenchyma. 
make sure that we have glomeruli, which are like the small units that make up the, the kidney. We want to make sure the sample has that, because otherwise the pathologist who's going to be taking a look at the sample under the microscope won't be able to make a diagnosis. So while patients on the table, it's been several, several years since I've looked through a microscope. And it was honestly a really awesome experience to kind of, the education you gained in medical school, make it go full circle, where now literally uh, my hands are you know bloody, my gloves are bloody, take off my gloves, take the sample, go downstairs, look under the microscope. Oh yeah, you know what? This is adequate sample. Cool, come upstairs. Hey, procedure's done. Close up and we're, we're good to go. So that was a really awesome experience. Um, also did a lymph node biopsy. So several biopsies done this week. Now, another another job that we do in a community hospital, pretty, pretty busy, is abscess drainage. Many times this week we had Perforated diverticulitis, diverticu diverticula, I should say, are basically small outpouchings that can develop usually within the large colon, and sometimes they can microperforate. And when that happens, your body starts to actually enclose that area and starts to contain the ruptured contents and you create like an abscess. So you can basically think of it almost as if you've seen Dr. Pimple Popper, it's basically the pimples of the, <laughs> the internal body. It's it's the pimples of the peritoneum. And these are basically contained collections and our job often is to put drains in them. So literally localize via the CAT scan, navigate between organs and between adjacent small bowel loops, and then actually get in there, place a locking loop catheter, drain out the pus, and it actually helps a lot for the patient. And it's really, really good for the patient. Sometimes, you know, more, oftentimes the reason why we do it is because uh, IV antibiotics is, are just not enough. So you're not gonna be able to penetrate this capsule. So this capsule needs to be penetrated via the, via the catheter that we put in there, the tube, and then we're able to drain out the pus. So very rewarding, and it actually makes a big difference on patient care. So we had a couple of those, perforated appendicitis. We even had like a suspected perforated cholecystitis or a gallbladder that was partially perforated and needed a tube to have the collection removed. Perforated diverticulitis, did plenty of those this week. Then moving on to the vascular side of things, because definitely, you know, we do a lot of vascular stuff in interventional radiology. And this particular week was a very interesting case, obviously for HIPAA. I'm not going to give away details of the case, but essentially there was a hepatic tumor that was causing some discomfort. It was a benign tumor, which means it's not a cancer, but it's an abnormal collection of hepatic tissue, which was causing pain in a patient. So I saw the patient in an outpatient setting, set them up for a procedure where basically what you do is you go and you hijack the internal blood uh, vessels that you already natively have. And through that, you put wires, you put small plastic catheters, and basically the goal is we're gonna cut off the blood supply to this tumor, and the tumor is gonna start to shrink and regress. So that was a really cool case. We had to go in through the groin, follow up into the abdomen, selectively go towards the hepatic artery. We do a couple of runs where we actually see the blood supply. So you actually see a tumor and then you see all the blood supply that's going to this tumor. It's a very vascular tumor. And then we use small particles to actually cut off the blood supply to this tumor. And then over time, the tumor starts to shrink and essentially die, starts to necrose because we cut off the blood supply to it. So that was a really cool case. Got to do this week for a hepatic tumor. And then we also did a couple of port insertions. Now, a lot of work in interventional radiology is, is oncology related. We do actual direct procedures uh, to actually minimize tumors, similar to like what, what I described for that hepatic tumor, but we also place a lot of chest ports. Now, the main therapy for cancer is chemotherapy. And in order to give and administer chemotherapy, you need a chest port. And essentially what a chest port is, it's a small reservoir that goes underneath the skin. So the small incision is made on the front of the chest. Is it a small pocket is created and that's where the chest port sits. And that chest port is connected internally with one of the larger vessels in your body. And the reason for that is because chemotherapy is so potent, you need a vessel that has the caliber to be able to accommodate those type of medicines. And so we place those routinely all the time. So we placed multiple chest ports during this week. And then once the chest port is there, just from the outside of the skin, you're able to access the a very large vessel going towards the heart just from the outside, uh, from the front of the chest. You don't have to actually get IVs. You can, you can draw blood from there and you can administer chemotherapy from there. And that usually is you know, the starting point for someone's therapy for their malignancy and for their cancer. So we are the doctors that place those chest ports oftentimes. So this week we placed several chest ports. 
And honestly, looking back at it, yeah, it's a pretty busy week. And I, like I said, you get so caught up in it, you don't think about it. Every night, yeah, you're happy, you got to do some cool stuff, but that was a brief overview of a typical week of a radiology resident who's rotating on interventional radiology. So if you look at it, pretty wide variety of cases. Some endovascular cases, some abscess drainages, some biopsies of various different parts of the body. And that's one of the cool things about interventional radiology. You're not really limited to any certain part of the body. You become an expert in anatomy through your diagnostic training and then you use your diagnostic training and the imaging to navigate to do surgical procedures without having to do huge incisions. And most of these patients, um, aside from a few of them who were who stayed one or two nights after the procedure, most of these patients came in, got their procedure done, and either were discharged the same day or they were discharged the day after. So we do pretty big, remarkable things through really small incisions, and that's one of my favorite things about interventional radiology. So there you go. That's a brief look of what a typical week was like. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts. I have more videos on radiology, diagnostic, as well as interventional. So check out my channel. And until next time.